and it does seem um, current large transformer architectures do exhibit many of the same forms of generality that the human brain has. And, and there is no reason to think we've kind of hit the ceiling. Um, and also from first principles, if you look at the human brain, it's a physiological system, quite impressive in many ways, but far from the physical limits of computation. Um, it has various constraints. First and most obviously, it's kind of restricted in size, like it has to fit inside a cranium. Whereas, like AIs can run on uh, arbitrarily large data centers, the size of warehouses or bigger, right? So it could just expand sort of spatially. And also, in terms of basic information processing, a human neuron operates on a time scale of maybe 100 hertz. It can sort of fire 100 times per second, um, give or take. Uh, whereas, even a current day transistor can operate at gigahertz. So billions of times a second. So there, there are various reasons to think that the ultimate limits to information processing with mature technology are just way beyond what biological human or other brains can, uh, can achieve. Um, so ultimately, the potential for intelligent information processing in machine substrate could just like vastly outstrip what biology is capable of. And uh, so I think if technological and scientific development is allowed to continue on a broad front, we will eventually reach there. And, and moreover, recently, it does seem like we are sort of, you know, on, on the path to, to sort of doing this. So th th those are some of the kind of basic considerations that look like, you know, we should take this quite seriously. And, um, and then you can think what it would mean if we really did develop AGI, artificial general intelligence. And, and I, I, I think the first thing it would mean is that we would soon develop super intelligence. I don't think we would go all the way up to sort of fully human level AI, and then suddenly it would stop there, right? It, mm. I think. So, so then we will have a world where we are able to engineer minds and where all human labor, not just kind of muscle labor, that we started to be able to um, um, automate with the industrial revolution, with steam engines and internal combustion. Like we have you know, digging machines that are much stronger than any human strong strong man, et cetera. But like we will then have machine minds that can outthink an, any human you know, genius scientist or artist. Um, and so it's really the last invention uh, we will ever need to make because from that point on, further inventions will be much better and faster uh, made by these machine minds. And mm -hmm. um, so it, it, I think, yeah, it will be a very fundamental transformation of of the human condition. And it's hard to reach. You can, some people say, well, the industrial revolution, and I think you can learn something from parallels to that, but maybe you need to go back more like to the origination of Homo sapiens in the first place, or, or maybe to the, the emergence of life. I, I think it would be more at that level. Um, wow. Ra rather than like, you know, the mobile internet or the cloud or, or one of these other sort of recent uh, buzzwords that people get excited about. Yeah, because it's almost like evolution. It, it, it's almost our evolution as humanity. It could lead to our extinction, but it could lead to also our evolution in terms of like how we interact with this AI or if we yeah, merge it, it could with be this the, AI. The, the big unlock, right? Like that yeah. kind of. Uh, so I think I mean so in my earlier work and um, like this this book, Super Intelligence: uh, Path to Your Strategies, came out in two thousand fourteen. That focused a lot on. Um, well, a, identifying this prospect that, like, that we will eventually get to AGI and superintelligence, and then also the risks associated with that, including existential risks. Um, because at the time, this was very much a neglected topic, like nobody was taking seriously, certainly nobody like in academia. Um, and yet, it seemed to me quite predictable that we would eventually reach that point. And that now, now, in fact, that is much more widely recognized. Um, mm -hmm. And things that have moved from sort of fringe dismissed as science fiction are now, you know, you see statements coming out from, you know, from the White House and other governments around the world. And the leading AI labs have now research teams specifically trying to solve scalable AI alignment, like the, the big technical problem of uh, how can you sort of develop algorithms that would allow you to steer arbitrarily intelligent AI systems. It's like a very much an active research frontier. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's very much part of my picture that there will be big risks associated with this transition. But at the same time, the uh, 
upside is enormous. The uh, uh, ability to unlock human potential, to to help alleviate human misery, and to really bring about a, a, a wonderful world. I see, I see it sort of as a as a kind of portal through which humanity at some point will need to passage. That all the the past really great futures ultimately, I think, lead at some point or another through this development of greater than human. Uh, uh, intelligence and mm. that we really need to be careful when we're doing it to make sure we get it right as far as we can um, but ultimately that it would be in itself I think a kind of existential catastrophe if we've sort of forever failed to take this next step mm. something that I keep thinking about is going back to this like we could be in an ancestral simulation and so there's post-humans who might be looking at us trying to study their own history and saying like, okay, like how did we really come about? And and maybe they're studying how humans could have evolved and created these advances and then created their own simulations. Like maybe they're trying to figure out how they became in existence. Does that make sense? Yeah, one possible reason, uh, as, as we alluded to earlier, for why a technologically mature civilization might run ancestor simulations would be this scientific motive of trying to better understand the dynamics that could shape the origination of other superintelligent civilizations. So if they mm -hmm. originate from sort of biologically evolved creatures, uh, then like studying those types of creatures, different possible creatures, the societies they build, the dynamics, uh, that, 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 that could be one one motive that could drive this. Um, but there are, yeah, there, there, are, there are other possible motives as well, but... Um, um, that's one of them. That's one of them. I mean, you might wonder whether it would saturate. So it's not just whether it could lead some advanced civilization to create some simulations, but you also have to think they could create very many simulations over the course of so these, these sort of mature civilizations might last for billions of years, right? And you might think that there would be diminishing returns to running scientific simulations. Like the first simulation, you learn a lot. Of, the next thousand, you learn a bit more. But after you've already run billions of simulations, maybe the incremental gain from running a few more starts to plateau. Mm -hmm. um, whereas there might be other reasons for running simulations that wouldn't be subject to the same diminishing returns. If that's the case, you might think most simulations they run would be ones driven by other motives than the scientific one. Like entertainment or something, for like, example, our, like our movies. Yeah, like if they play some intrinsic value on simulations, for instance, that would be one example of a motive that might not saturate in the same way. Hmm. Um, I want to move on to understanding your three levels of AI. So you have oracles, genies, and sovereigns. Can you explain which, what each one is and maybe some of the risks of each one? Yeah, it's not so much levels, but more types. Okay. Um, so an Oracle AI basically is a question answering system, um, like an AI that you ask a question and it gives an answer. This is kind of similar to what these large language models have mm -hmm. in effect been. Um, they don't really do anything, but they answer questions. And so this is like one template. Um, a genie would be some task executing AI. So you give it a particular task and it performs the task. These types of systems are currently in development. Uh, maybe we'll see this year more agent-like systems being released. Already just actually, I think last week, OpenAI uh, released Codex, which is a sort of um, coding agent that you can assign a programming task and it goes off and starts mucking around with your code base and you know, hopefully solves the task. Um, and you could imagine this being generalized maybe in a few years to physical tasks with robots that can, you know, do, do, the, do the laundry or sweep the driveway or do like these things. Mm. Um, like a, a genie is more an AI that um, operates autonomously in the world in pursuit of some open-ended long-range objective. Um, like, you know, make the world better or make people happy or uh, enforce the peace between these two different nations and is kind of autonomously running around trying to shape the world in favor of that. The, the way that currently, like, humans and nation states 
are, and maybe corporations to some extent, these kind of open-ended. It's not just that they're doing one specific task mm. and then come back for more instructions. They have their own sort of open-ended. So, so these are three different sort of templates for what kind of AI system one might try to build. And they, they come with different pros and cons from, from a safety point of view and a utility point of view. Mm. Um, did you go over what, so Sovereign is more like an organization or a nation and has like multiple steps, correct? And Genie yeah, kind of I mean, carries it, it out could, like one it thing? Be, it could be a, a, a single agent as well. Like, okay. In this sense, it doesn't mean sovereign as in national sovereignty. It like means that you could be a sovereign if you, if you, if you set yourself the goal in life of, of trying to uh, alleviate the suffering of the global poor, for instance, that... Mm -hmm. You can do that your whole life. It involves many specific little tasks, like oh, trying to raise money for this charity and trying to launch this new campaign or trying to, you know, invent some new medicine that will help. You know, all of these would be sort of subtasks, but it's in pursuit of this open-ended objective. Um, so similarly, you could have an AI system. Maybe internally, it's like a unified, simple agent architecture, but that is operating in pursuit of such open-ended objective. Com conversely, like even an, an oracle that just tries to answer a question internally, theoretically, could be a multi-agent architecture. We have different sort of research agents that get sent off to answer different sub-questions in order then to combine at the end to, to produce an answer to, to the user. So one has to distinguish sort of the internal architecture of the system from the, the role that it is designed to uh, play in society. Got it. Um, what are the different ways that each one of these types of AI could go wrong? Um, yeah, so um, they they all share a bunch of things that could go wrong with all of them, which is however they are intended to operate, they might not actually operate that way. So you might construct an AI that you intend to serve just as a question answering system, but then internally it might have goal seeking processes. Um, just as if you assign like a scientist a question that they should, uh, you know, try to figure out the answer to, like how safe is this drug, you know, what like. But then in the course of trying to answer that, they might have to make plans and pursue goals, like oh, how do I you know, get the research grant to uh, fund this 